Welcome to Cover to Cover Book Beat. I'm your host, Roger Nichols. McCracken Post and Jr. is a practicing criminal defense attorney and former four-term legislature of the Golden Georgia House of Representatives. He's practiced for many years, gained national attention for his handling of several notable cases, including a spectacular case in his hometown of Ringgold, Georgia, that was featured on just about everywhere. CNN Presents, Dateline NBC, A&E's American Justice, etc., and in national newspapers. He's detailed that case now in his book, Zenith Man, Death, Love, and Redemption in a Georgia Courtroom. It reveals the truth about a man, Alvin Ridley, unjustly charged in his wife's death, and sends a message about undiagnosed and misdiagnosed developmental disorders in the criminal justice system. Zenith Man is a powerfully written story, all the more shocking for being completely true. We're very pleased to welcome the author, Grack and Post and Junior. Roger, thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm, very, we... I'm very honored. I can tell you were a reporter. Uh, I, I've, I've been down that road, yes. <laughs> but before we start with the book, I want to find a little bit more about you personally. Were you always going to be a lawyer? No, I don't think so. I was the uh, the last of six kids. Uh, I had a buddy in uh, junior high and high school that he and I were thick as thieves. And uh, uh, his idea about law school was one I just followed, you know, followed closely. And uh, we actually ended up going to the same college and law school together. And oh. uh, sadly, he passed uh, a couple of years ago of a, a rare cancer. And uh, so I, I, I mentioned him in the book and the acknowledgments as well. I, I appreciate that. And you also had some experience working for a congressman as an intern? I did. Uh, uh, George Buddy Darden, who uh, at the time represented Northwest Georgia in Congress, and I was actually in law school, but uh, went up and stayed in Washington for a long summer. And really, uh, if the bug had bitten me, it was now fully infected. <laughs> well, it, it apparently worked because you got elected four times. So. Well, it worked. Uh, maybe I ought to write a book about uh, how to keep office in a changing landscape, <laughs> uh, because there were some very interesting uh, disqualifications that happened, but the, the area was, uh, was changing. Um, I just didn't feel, uh, that I could change, even though I was a Southern Democrat. Um, I just didn't feel like the label meant anything as long as you were representing your constituents. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, politically I was dead wrong. Uh, the incumbent congressman, switched parties after telling everyone he wouldn't and getting reelected and immediately switched parties. And so I, I knew that I needed to get either full time into it uh, because the Georgia legislature is a part time mm -hmm. uh, thing that I needed to either get full time into it or get out. And that was uh, that was my effort. Uh, short lived as it was, it was a, uh, a, a an ass whipping, as we say, uh, in North Georgia, I, I I didn't carry a county, and this was uh, at a time where I used to carry my state state house district by margins of up to seventy percent. Wow! So you know, labels are are meaningful. Mm -hmm. uh, I was immediately labeled by a guy who was in my party his entire career until he wasn't. Mm. And, uh, you know, it it, it left a, a, a bad taste in my mouth, but it was also, you know, quite a shock. Mm. And that's where I found myself uh, at the beginning of this book, which is a true book. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the events that took place 27 years previously, why, what was the impetus that made you become an author? Roger, I wanted to write this book Um uh, starting the night after the verdict came in i never thought of it before mm -hmm. but the way it it ended in such a incredible last 48 hours of the trial that i really felt like this would be a good book uh the poet maya angelo said there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you and when i first read that several years ago i got it it, it it described exactly how I felt, but I was frustrated in the effort. Now, 
I gave the story away to anybody who would come by. Um, a great Atlanta reporter uh, was uh, picked up by the Washington Post and they sent their own reporter down, did a front page Washington Post story in 1999 about the trial. Um, that led to a People magazine article that those led to the TV shows, Forensic Files and American Justice, which were great to participate in. I probably had more to do with NPR's Snap Judgment, mm. a 25 minute program in which I gave five hours of interview. <laughs> so none of these mediums were satisfying. And overall, what was not satisfying was that I couldn't explain Alvin more than saying, well, he's very eccentric. Mm -hmm. And only when we were doing yet another podcast uh, from the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, one that has not come out yet, um, the podcaster reached out to a juror from the case who had since the trial become a nurse and practices in Alaska. And she sent a message to me through him to say, do you think Alvin is autistic? Well, the moment it was suggested, I had learned about autism as we all have in the last 25 years. Nobody was talking about autism in adults in 1999. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the, the, it, it was discussed widely about children. The concept of a spectrum was new, relatively yeah. new. And, but there, if you'll remember, there was a lot of energy spent on what the hell's causing all this and trying to act like it was a new thing. In fact, we've had uh, neurodivergent people, I think since there've been people mm -hmm. and, and some of our greatest contributors uh, count themselves as uh, and are counted as neurodivergent by mm -hmm. by diagnoses. Mm -hmm. So I immediately began to realize there are in you know just a small amount of research that there are five million plus undiagnosed adults that have not aged out of life, <laughs> but but existed before the schools started catching. Yeah. Uh, the diagnosis. So five and a half million people, that's a lot of potential encounters with police, with lawyers who don't know what to do with them, and with judges who can be set off by somebody not looking them in the eye mm -hmm. or somebody not directly answering a question. The very things that Alvin Ridley did, the very things that Alvin Ridley had used against him at trial, his actual autistic mannerisms were used against him at trial. And I didn't know how to defend it. I didn't know how to defend against a flat vocal effect that the 911 call was, was uh, uh, filled with, or uh, the fact that they said his emotions were not meeting the moment, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, he does. He's not acting like a guy whose wife of so many years mm -hmm. just died. Of course, making things more difficult was the fact that nobody had seen Virginia Ridley in 27 years. And unfortunately, that information, along with the speculation of her surviving family, uh, was that Alvin was keeping her and keeping her from them. And so because my client was so difficult and would not let me in his house and didn't even want to talk about the murder case. I would say he, he wanted instead to talk about the fact that they had been evicted from public housing in, in 1970. And this was 1997 and 1998 when we we're preparing yeah. for trial. And a van that the government seized in 1984 that he was so obsessed with I understand now that that's part of his neurodivergent uh, mm -hmm. personality, that he loops back to something that that he 
uh, feels is a great slight, and he will bring it up every chance he gets as just the uh, the injustices that they mm -hmm. suffered. Well, I, I started because I, he made me, I started studying all this ancient litigation that resulted in his van getting seized because he was filing what we would call frivolous lawsuits. Yeah. But in Alvin's mind, they were quite, there was quite a causal connection yeah. between a minor car accident that his father had in a company vehicle to his father's death from pancreatic cancer two years later. He could not convince Alvin that there was not a causal connection. Mm -hmm. So at some point, uh, when I finally got him to come to my office, he uh, would start talking about the van again. And at some point, and you read the book, uh, mm -hmm. I was just exasperated. And I just said, oh, Lord, like the van, oh, Lord. <laughs> Alvin interpreted that as the beginning of a prayer. And he assumed a childlike prayer position with his hands clasped and his eyes closed tight. And I immediately realized I can work with this. <laughs> and so, so I began praying a lot of my legal advice to him. And at least he would sit and listen. Mm -hmm. And and I would dress it up in what I was praying for the Lord to tell Alvin. And here's why Alvin needs to do this. But at the same time, it was very frustrating. And we had nothing. And at some point in one of those early meetings in uh, in 1998, um, my secretary walks in. I was defeated in 1996, and Virginia died 11 months later. I immediately began advising Alvin like three days, uh, within two days of her, uh, or three days of her passing. And um, so here's my congressman calling me. And of course I'd known him from when we were both in the Georgia uh, Capitol. And, and so I thought, well, this is pleasant. You know, it, it, maybe this is kind of a step toward reconciliation uh, from uh, that campaign. And Alvin kind of straightened up in his chair, like maybe the call was about him, which I kind of laughed off and, mm -hmm. I called the congressman. Alvin asked me, Are, you know, ain't you going to call the congressman? And so I do. And thankfully, I did not have it on speakerphone. I just had it to my ear. And the congressman, who was never one for pleasantries, uh, ordered me to keep Alvin Ridley away from his congressional office. Said that he was scaring the ladies there. Well, yeah. Alvin was in the newspapers, you know, for a, allegedly holding his wife's wife captive for decades and then killing her. In the tabloid, it was sicko holds wife hostage, then kills her. It was uh, a, a, an amazing, here's here's the tabloid. Oh, yeah. Kind of blown up from yeah. 1998. Wow. The, the other bookend is an article her parents put in the local papers in 1968. Oh. And those were the bookends of Virginia's being missing. Mm -hmm. uh, Dolly Parton and Carl Dean slipped away to Ringgold, Georgia from Nashville to get married. We were the marriage capital of the South. We were near uh, three other states. It was a one-stop shop to get married, blood test, license, uh, justice of the peace. Dolly and Carl Dean got married uh, at the Baptist church, though. The, they found a preacher in. And three weeks later, Alvin and Virginia wed at hmm. another Baptist church. Now, by the time George Jones and Tammy Wynette slipped down to Ringgold, Georgia, to wed, Virginia was already missing. Yeah. And this was to her family. Those were the only people really looking for her. But it was characterized as nobody had seen her for those 30 years because Alvin made me study all this ancient litigation. I looked at a contested eviction that Alvin took to a jury trial, of course. Mm -hmm. And, uh, there was a jury list in the file and I actually knew the name of one of the jurors and I called her up and I said, there's no way you'd remember this from 20 is something years ago, 20, at that time, it was 28 years ago. 
and she remembered it. She said it was the most, one of the most bizarre trials that the Alvin was kind of making a circus of it, wanting to talk about the ban wasn't taken by then, but by, by, about the eviction. And interestingly enough, Virginia's parents were at the eviction. And Judge Painter at the time, the Superior Court judge, he stopped the trial, ordered Virginia to be obtained, made Alvin sit in the courtroom while his father went and got Virginia, brought her to the courthouse where Virginia, Alvin's father, and Virginia's parents all went back into chambers and Alvin was not allowed to go. Uh, they emerged. Virginia went home with her husband. Her parents left and never put another article in the paper. Mm. Well, 27 years later, when Virginia died and nobody had seen her, most of us didn't know she existed. Um, her remaining family uh, picked up the mantle of the allegation. And in a uh, tabloid frenzied world, I'm glad we were in the early stages of the internet because it would have yeah. been a hundred or a thousand times worse. Um, we had that to face that, that kind of allegation. The book itself has got so many, rough, it's more twists and turns than a cheap garden hose, I'll tell you. But it's fun <laughs> in that there are some key things, key developments. I won't give the whole book away, but I've never had a book where a leftover Thanksgiving dinner played such an important part. Oh my gosh. It's, it's, and I've, I've learned since that with autism, there's very often a very transactional personality. I didn't realize that, but I started realizing it when I would basically pay Alvin to cooperate with me. He lived as, as if he were impoverished, yet when uh, we went to get him appointed counsel, the court pointed out that he had significant assets, uh, property. Uh, a lot of it had not been yet transferred to his name, but he had assets. And yet he lived and dressed and poor mouthed, as we say in the South, mm -hmm. uh, constantly acting like he didn't have anything. And I think in his mind, he didn't. I quickly got him on uh, VA disability mm -hmm. um, because I, I told him, I said, there's, there's an income. He was in his 50s at the time, so he wasn't old enough for Social Security. But I got him on VA disability. The, the state psychologist had diagnosed him with a paranoid condition and somatization, which is a, a mental uh, illness where you imagine physical conditions and pains, and you basically have them because you've brought them on in through your mind. Yeah. Hence the soft neck collar that Alvin insisted on wearing as the pressure mounted before this trial. He wore this ridiculous huge soft neck collar that uh, unfortunately uh, he forgot the first day of trial because I had to like coax him to come to court. And, uh, and he insisted that there was a provision of the constitution that said, if you don't feel well, you could just get up and leave court at any time. That would come so, be useful. Yeah. I was, I was, I started having to carry a copy of the U.S. Constitution with me, the little paperback copies you can get at the mm -hmm. bookstore, and throwing it at him every time he would raise that. And I would say, find the article and I will file the, the motion. <laughs> well, well, to get back to the, I, want, I do want to get this one point out about the Thanksgiving leftovers and how, how much that meant to the whole, the whole case in itself. Well, uh, I, I had nothing going into very close to the first scheduled trial, which would have been September of 1998. And a great gift happened when the DA served 45 new witnesses on me. And I'm a solo practitioner. So I went to the court and uh, Alvin wanted me to file an emotion, as he called them, <laughs> an emotion for continuance. And I looked at the old civil litigation that Alvin maintained on his own. And he filed a lot of emotions 
And uh, so I told the court, there's no way as a private practitioner uh, at the time without an investigator uh, that I could go through all these state witnesses that just got served on me. So the court gave us a continuance. I was so relieved because I had nothing. Two big breaks happened. One, and it's tragic, but the death of Olympic track star Florence Griffith Joyner in that month, that very month of September of 1998. Of course, you know, I just noticed that on the news because I had actually gone to the Atlanta Olympics in 1996. I saw her, but she was not competing. She was a very beautiful, flamboyant woman with a lot of style. She just had a, a real following. And, um, but again, she was not competing and I didn't know why at the time, uh, by the next m month, her autopsy, uh, was at least spoken of in the news and just happened to hear it on CNN headline news that she died of a seizure. Well, that was our theory for, about Virginia's death. Alvin said she, he called her an epileptic, but, uh, it was clear from her even childhood um, medical records that she had severe epilepsy. And obviously she was not treating it. And the question then became and a, a suggestion from the state that Alvin deprived her of these medicines. So, but the state was insisting this was a asphyxiation, straight up killing. And um, so, when I learned that, that she, uh, Flojo, the track star, Olympic star, had died from epilepsy, I was immediately on the phone with her uh, medical examiner. And I obtained a copy of her autopsy. And it was extremely similar to the autopsy of Virginia Ridley that the state of Georgia was saying was murder. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was definitely important. The second huge break, totally out of the blue, happened on Thanksgiving Day of 1998. My new wife, I had divorced in uh, 96, uh, remarried in 98. And uh, this was a, a young woman from Ringgold. So she already came fully uh, uh, installed with all the local prejudices and biases about Alvin Ridley, but I was kind of winning her over because I was telling her all the different interesting ways I found Alvin and, and even found a, a, a kind of a kind and, and caring person inside of him. So um, in any event, uh, we went to her parents' house and then we went to my parents' house in Graysville, Georgia. And my dad, who was always loved dealing with outsiders. He was a loyal Alvin Ridley customer mm -hmm. from the Rid Ridley Zenith television. We had Zenith console televisions when I was growing up. And uh, my parents put together a turkey plate and they said, we'd like for you to take this to Alvin Ridley. And that was the last thing I wanted to do on Thanksgiving, my day off as this trial was now looming again, five weeks away. But I went, took my, my wife home, and then I went straight to Alvin's house, did not call him. I had gotten a phone installed in his house to help us communicate better. He saw through my ruse. I was willing to get a phone installed so I could get in the house. He would not let me in the house mm -hmm. for over a year. When I showed up with the phone installer, Alvin decided then and there, install it on the porch, <laughs> so on the outside of the main interior of the house. So um, here we are on Thanksgiving Day, and I've got a wonderfully smelling uh, paper bag with a tin foil covered plate. And I beat on the door and I always kind of stood back because Alvin always said he had guns and uh, had brandished them before, according to uh, the sheriff. And so I would knock and then hold back a little bit and turn myself sideways to make myself a smaller target. Alvin came to the door. I said, Alvin, my, my folks wanted you to have some Thanksgiving. 
dinner. Well, again, the transactional Alvin kicked in. He looked at it. He said, just a minute. I could hear him go in. Thought I heard him talking to somebody. I heard him turn the TV down. He came to the door and said, come on in. I was not prepared. I didn't have a camera. I just thought I can't, I can't not go in. Yeah. So I went in and this very dark room. Now that the TV off, it was much darker. And, um, he turned on, it was a tiny red, like Christmas, the old Christmas light bulb, but up that big that was illuminating the room in this weird red glow, but there was a string and he pulled it and a regular, naked light bulb uh in a ceiling mount came on well i recognized immediately virginia's deathbed from the photos it had it looked like it's had the same covers on it and everything they were both sleeping on the outside of the covers both slept in their clothes i began to realize that alvin slept in his clothes until they would just about fall off and so I would start buying him some clothes. Uh, Land's End, if I can give them a plug. They are dressing Alvin Ridley for the last uh, 15 years or more. Um, or 25 you years, I you, say. you said you did that sort of in self-defense as well, because... Well, Alvin's, the bathing. Uh, Alvin's hygiene was not the best. I later learned, of course, that it was a, te a, a tactile thing. He did not like the feel of water on his skin. Mm -hmm. And and that's part of his neurodivergent uh, personality. Had I known it then, I would have felt a lot better about him. And I would have, and I certainly would not have mentioned it to him like I did once, but I immediately mm -hmm. felt bad when I did. I immediately had this just gut feeling that he really can't help this. Yeah. Um and now, you know, I still feel bad about that. But I was um, I was in this house, and I, I see that on one whole wall, it's covered from floor to ceiling with paper, just different pieces of paper, tacked, taped, stapled, any way you could attach paper uh, to a wall, a panel wall. Uh, and then... They, they seem to all bear the same handwriting and this handwriting with a very interesting uh, lower extender uh, as I think the, the trade of, uh, of handwriting analysts uh, will say, this is one of the, the writings. It's, there's an exhibit in the trial, as you can see the exhibit label. Yeah. I call this one the Rosetta Stone because it it explained so much in and of itself. It explained Virginia not liking to go out. It explained some of the problems they were having with her family. They were it explained um why they didn't hang out in the housing uh, unit which ultimately they were evicted from because of a, an exterminator's advances on Virginia. Mm. And instead of, you know, raising hell about it, Alvin and Virginia would just quietly leave the place every day before the exterminator would run, you know, and they had no idea when he was going to run, but they were just uh, very paranoid both. They were two peas in a pod. So, um, I learned and, you know, I had to deal with Alvin's reluctance to let me have the documents. Uh, ultimately, again, transactional Alvin, I had to pay him $200 to just copy them. Uh, and then I knew if I could get them copied, I could serve them on the DA. And then I would worry about getting them to court later. Yeah. The compromise there was that Alvin would keep them uh, and maintain them. Well, I developed this elaborate filing system where I made myself a copy. And this copying process was quite elaborate, too, because I realized that Alvin and his legal advisor, which was a man who rode around town on a bicycle selling products out of the basket, 
from catalogs, a guy that everybody calls Salesman Sam, kind of somewhat derisively, um, that Salesman Sam was giving him legal advice too, and it was often counter to mine and resulted in some some near misses, legal near misses. Um, but the, the compromise was that Alvin would keep the originals in these old, you know, and then bring them to court. Well, he brought them to court in these old suitcases, but he would have at night at home opened up the old suitcases, uh, reshuffled what I had already kind of organized, but he would also let, it was almost as if he opened it up and scores of cockroaches would just march into the suitcases only to march out into the courtroom because that's what was happening. They were, and I didn't realize the jurors were seeing them until uh, one of the jurors was interviewed on Forensic Files and she's talking about the cockroaches coming out of the suitcases and how all the jurors were noticing it. Well, the Superior Court judge, whose office was right next to that courtroom, he noticed it. And halfway through the trial, he said, Mr. Poston, we are uh, resuming the trial in the other building, in the old courtroom, and because I have to get this room exterminated. <laughs> and so what was fascinating and eerie about that, Roger, we were moving into the courtroom, which was the last place Virginia Ridley had ever been seen in public, September 15, 1970. And it was eerie. I, I'm not a I'm not a ghost person, but it was just too much. I, I felt a, I felt empowered. I felt like I really had something to say yeah. uh, in my closing, uh, because you know all of that happened right there. It was like we were reenacting it, and the jury was seeing how difficult Alvin was for me to try to manage, but they also saw me giving in to him. Uh, what they didn't see and what I didn't see was Jesus showing up during lunch and telling him he had to testify. We knew all along that Virginia had, had epilepsy. Mm -hmm. uh, we had her childhood medical records. She had severe epilepsy. Uh, she also had occasions before she married Alvin where she would have horrific allergic reactions to the medication. Mm. So she would sometimes have to be hospitalized for the medication. Among Virginia's writings was a Bible uh, which listed a, a September 1977 without a day specific that said, God told me to stop taking my medicine. And knowing her background that she would have reactions to the medicine or she could have a seizure i think she just opted to have the occasional seizure mm. and she lived for 20 years now in addition to her writings in the house was everything that ever came into that house never left and i found years of medicine bottles oh. interestingly enough the ones around September, October of 1977, and for a few months until there were no more, they were full of medicine. Oh. So showing that Alvin had indeed even kept getting the medicine for her. And one of the pharmacists just conveniently, or doctors, conveniently just started putting the medication in Alvin's name. In other words, the town, the small town used to accommodate yeah. for them. And and Alvin would get this uh, uh, medication put in his name, and he never had epilepsy. So yeah. it was simply the way the doctor got around not seeing the patient. And, and so uh, what we didn't know, I, so we knew all along that that it was epilepsy that killed her. I had to get, and this was rudimentary internet, but I would get on and find uh, medical abstracts. And every one about dying from epilepsy had a, in a string of doctor's names at the bottom, 
this one doctor was in all of them. And these are medical journal abstracts. Uh, and it was B, the initial B, Wanamaker. Um, even with the internet in its early stages, I could look up B. Wanamaker epilepsy and found Braxton Bryant Wanamaker in Orangeburg, South Carolina, and quickly got directory assistance to give me a number. Uh, within a couple of days, I was talking with him. Um, you know, I guess he sensed the urgency in my voice. I said, I don't know if you do this, but I really need uh, an expert about epilepsy and death and petechial hemorrhages, because that's what the state of Georgia was basing it all on, is these petechiae around Virginia's eyes and mouth and around Florence Griffith Joyner's eyes and mouth. The state of Georgia was saying, well, that means she was manually asphyxiated. Every other medical book and Florence Griffith Joyner's autopsy were saying that's from a seizure. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what I didn't know, and I didn't think there was an explanation for it, I thought it odd that Virginia wrote apparently every day of 30 plus years. And because I'm having to pay the, for these experts out of my pocket, you bring them in the night before you put them on the stand, you go out to dinner with them, give them their check, and then you try to get them off the stand in one day or you're going to be yeah. paying a lot more money. Yeah. So um, my uh, young wife and I uh, went and met Dr. Wanamaker in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and took him out to dinner. And as I wrote in the book, he was a very serious man. Uh, I felt silly being next to him. Uh, my my efforts at conversation, I felt that man, I I'm this guy's way out of my league in terms of just normal conversation. But we gave it our best shot, and it was just an awkward dinner. But at the very end, we were among the last people in the restaurant. Uh, he said, "Is there anything else unusual about this woman?" And I said, "Absolutely, she couldn't." I don't remember what. I probably wrote it in the book, but yeah, I said she couldn't do anything without noting it, writing it down, and without missing a beat. He said, that's hypergraphia. Mm -hmm. And of course, I said, hyper what? Yeah, you know, he said, uh, very often in some forms of epilepsy, particularly temporal lobe epilepsy, there is a compulsion to produce graphic content be it art or the written word. And it didn't, he just completely understood it. He said, I have some patients, they bring me these voluminous journals wanting me to read them. And I say, you know, I don't need to read them, but you know, thanks for writing them. Thanks for keeping up with yourself so closely. And among those writings on the wall were recipes, were things Alvin reported from the outside world, beefs that Alvin was having with different people in the community, the guy from the city who messed up their water line. That was one of her last writings. She was beefing about some guy in the city that, you know, uh, did something that messed up their water line. And what's then there was the correspondence. Here is a letter from a U.S. senator referencing Virginia's letter to President Richard M. Nixon about their improper eviction from the Ringgold Housing Project. <laughs> and President Nixon's office passed the buck to HUD, Housing and Urban, Urban Development, who had in, engaged the Georgia Senator, David Gambrell, who was briefly a senator from Georgia, and who wrote... Uh, Virginia Ridley. Uh, she also wrote uh, Presidents Carter and uh, Ford. Uh, oh, no, no. Carter and Reagan. Uh -huh. um, Alvin tells me, and I believe he's telling the truth because I worked in Washington in 1984. And he tells me 
you know, after this voluminous litigation that he and his mother maintained in their names, um, somebody bit back and counterclaimed and got a judgment they thought and seized Alvin's uh, 1977 Chevy van, even listed the van in the legal section of the local newspaper to sell to help pay for the attorney's fees of the aggrieved uh, uh, defendant counterclaimant. So um, Alvin figured out that they did not properly seize that van and he raised it and they brought the van back three weeks later. But Alvin refuses to touch it. Now, at the time that I was learning this story, the van had been sitting untouched in the yard for 15 years. This year, next month, 40 years. Wow. And Alvin maintains that if he touches it, it starts a new statute of limitations and he wants some time to figure out his next move. So he doesn't want to touch it quite yet. <laughs> so, so this van is, you know, you'd have to get a chainsaw to get it out now yeah. because of the tree growth. But what's, what's fascinating about all of that was Virginia wrote to the producers of Unsolved Mysteries, the TV show. Uh -huh. how, how interesting is that? Uh -huh. The biggest unsolved mystery is writing Unsolved Mysteries. Yeah. And she wants to talk about Alvin's father's car wreck and the county taking their van. <laughs> so uh, I think she was probably on the spectrum. Uh -huh. And uh, in addition to her other problems. But she clearly loved Alvin very much by all of her writings. She clearly uh, shared his paranoid view of the world. Um, but Alvin tells a story, and I know it's true because he it's so self-depreciating in a sense when you hear it. But he tells me that Virginia sent him to Ronald Reagan. Uh -huh. And after the van got taken. And of course, returned, but Alvin wanted to complain of, to Ronald Reagan. So Alvin said he drove to Washington, D.C. He, <laughs> he told me which car it was, and it was one of them that he still had because he still had all of his old cars in various states of decomposition. And um, he said it took about six quarts of oil to get for that trip, which sounds about right uh, for one of his cars. I asked him, well, how did you find Ronald Reagan? He said, well, I asked directions. They showed me where the White House was. And then I had to find a parking place, which, you know, could have taken quite a while. But then he said, there's this gate. When you're looking at the White House, there's this gate on the left. It's wide open. And I went in. And I said, and what happened, Alvin? And I could have told him what was going to happen. Yeah. He said, some men with long guns yelled, halt. <laughs> and they said, what is your business here? And he said, Catoosa County took my van, illegal seized my van. They said, go home. <laughs> and so Alvin tells this on himself. And I'm thinking that's about where that gate is, as I recall. And it always appeared to be open, as I recalled in the 80s when I worked yeah. up there. But then I said, well, what did you do then? He said, well, I went to a payphone booth. And I called Nancy Reagan. <laughs> and I said, really, Alvin, you talked to Nancy Reagan? And he goes, yeah. And I said, well, how do you know it was Nancy Reagan? And he looks at me like I'm an idiot. And he says, I called the White House. That's where they live. A woman <laughs> answered. <laughs> so the woman or Nancy Reagan yeah. asked what, he, what his business was. And he said something to the effect of Catoosa County illegal seized my van. And I said, well, what did Nancy Reagan tell you, Alvin? And he said, go home. <laughs> <laughs> so I believe this happened. I yeah. went so far as to try to contact the Reagan presidential library yeah. to see what access I could have of calls. But I don't know that he ever got to identify himself. Oh, yeah. So I'm sure the White House gets all kinds of calls from various citizens mm -hmm. who think they could just dial up the president or the first lady. Yeah. Um, but it was 
just classic Alvin. Yeah. So, um, but, but hypergraphia was learned about hours before I put that expert witness yeah. on the stand. And suddenly now I could explain all those writings. Yeah. That were coming out of the roach filled suitcases <laughs> and i could explain them and it, it was just like it supercharged our case uh just like flo joe's autopsy did yeah and um the real question then came down to i i really felt that a jury would not cotton to a man when talking about his dear dead wife constantly shifting over and talking about a Chevy van. Yeah. So I had pretty much convinced Alvin that I don't think you should testify. You don't have to, that you're right to, but it's your right not to, and they can't make you. We had a disastrous Thursday morning on the full, the full week of the trial. We actually started on a Thursday, but we, the next Thursday, uh, we were very close to ending there was another, and I'm using air quotes here. I'm glad this is a video yeah. expert witness that Alvin wanted to hire. We found him on the internet. And Roger, this was back in the innocent days where I felt if somebody is on the internet, they've got to be valid and good. <laughs> but I wanted, Alvin uncharacteristically, became engaged in his case whenever I talked about getting a forensic pathologist. Alvin would make me spell it every time I ever said it. So we found this guy in Georgia who quoted me a fee. I did not vet him very well. Um, he ended up being somewhat of a disaster, an unmitigated disaster. Um, turns out he wasn't licensed to do any of the things that I felt he was licensed to do. He really shouldn't be calling himself a doctor in, in the United States. But um, the DA was laying in wait. The state crime lab had been dealing with this guy for quite a while. This was their opportunity. I later learned that they uh, asked the DA to come down so that they could tell him about this guy and how you know, he was saying things and presenting himself in certain ways that were not necessarily uh, legit. So that was a disaster. It all happened on a Thursday morning. And I was so mad at myself because it was really all on me. I did not vet this guy. I got so excited about Dr. Wanamaker and that aspect of the case. I really was just was keeping this guy around because he was a late hire just days before the trial. I felt like he could go describe the inside of the house because the state doctor didn't go the inside of the house. The state was making a big deal about how one side of the bed had an impression. The other side did not that Alvin was Virginia was not sleeping in the bed, but that he somehow moved her body to the bed after her death. And, um, you know, I wanted to show that this was a poor house. It didn't have a nice sofa love seat set. Mm -hmm. If you were watching TV in this house, you were sitting on the side of the bed. If you mm -hmm. wanted to watch TV straight up and not have your brain adjust it, you know, when you're laying down, you were sitting on that one side of the bed. Everyone was sitting on that one side of the bed. And so it was depressed on that one side of the bed only. And I wanted, since we did have this doctor going in the house. Well, the problem is the doctor was as afraid of Alvin as anybody was. And I noticed that he was packing a weapon and I was trying to signal that's not necessary. You know, you and Alvin was so uncharacteristically into the guy being there that we later learned that Alvin had created a non-crime scene. Um, there was a woman in the newspaper during jury selection talking about Alvin years before driving around town with a 
a, a store window mannequin pretending that he had a girlfriend. Oh. Now, this was after high school. This was before he married. But they just throw that out there. Another weird thing that Alvin did. Well, Alvin tells me he was trying to make another woman jealous. Oh. And that's why he drove around with his mannequin girlfriend, you know, sitting awkwardly in the passenger seat. But the newspaper article reminded Alvin that he had a 1950s era mannequin in the basement. And so he decides to employ it on his non-crime scene. Okay. So uh, when uh, the, this expert and I took him and Alvin out to dinner at a Red Lobster, and Alvin was so excited, the guy spent less than two minutes in the house. He wanted to get out so badly. And Alvin sees that he has a gun, and Alvin starts brandishing a gun. I was the only unarmed person in this house. And so... Uh, it was just a disaster. And then the following morning was equally a disaster. And, you know, we all went to lunch. Alvin suddenly began to have a little following of a, the latest church that he had invaded uh, because Alvin church hopped and usually got uh, ran off for uh, soliciting for money uh, all the time. So yeah, there was a long, there was a lot of letters from churches asking Alvin, you're welcome to come but don't ask for any more money. And um, so uh, he had a little following, a little blonde family, a mother and a father and a couple of kids. And I said, you know, Alvin, why don't you sit with your friends here? Also salesman, Sam. I said, y'all just sit together. I'll buy everybody's lunch. I just need to think. Because we were getting down to ready to, you know, rest. And during that lunch, Alvin told me Jesus appeared to him in a vision telling them that he had to testify. I panicked, but I knew that was his right. I could, only he could make that call. I had not prepped him. I got a few extra minutes. We went into the roach filled courtroom that had been exterminated, but I put Alvin on the stand and I grilled him and I showed him how if he put his good character into evidence, a lot of weird, crazy stuff that I had successfully kept out could come rolling back in. And Alvin was inspired. I mean, he, he was incredible on the stand. He exhibited the emotion that the DA had been spending a whole trial showing that he had none for his wife. He it, he was the interplay of attorney and client, who was which was still testy at times, became now the highlight of humor. Jurors were laughing at my what I was going through. I completely forgot how literal the guy was, and he was doing so well. I got ahead of myself and I said, "You know, Alvin, we." tell the jury what you've lost here. And I, I wanted him to say the obvious, my best friend, the love of my life, the my only friend. But instead, Alvin looks, thinks, and reaches for his glasses again out of his pocket. And he goes, oh, I guess I lost the funeral bill. <laughs> and of course, you know, the DA, I see the DA starting to write it down. And I thought, okay, we're going to hear that again. But there was another moment where I was so proud because Alvin had used other lawyers through the years, but he always ran them off and always, uh, uh, you know, just ended up representing himself. And I, I was kind of proud and I was going through, I went through all his ancient litigation, which he wanted to go through. I, I, I asked him, Alvin, uh, Matter of fact, I think I'm the first lawyer to stay with you from the beginning of a matter to the end, aren't I? And just this perfect comic timing, he said, so far. <laughs> In other words, I could get the ax any minute and the jurors are laughing. And I'm thinking this is a murder trial. Yeah. The jurors are enjoying this. They're smiling. This is not a bad position to be in. Yeah. Now, um, uh, I don't know if I told you 
because we had some technical difficulties and yeah. we came back. But um, the congressman did call me back when I wanted to leave the case yeah. earlier in 1998. And he told me, ordered me to keep Alvin Ridley away from his congressional offices. Roger, I got to tell you, you know, I was really thinking about walking away from that case because Alvin was so difficult. That call gave me the resolve to stay on the case uh. just out of spite. <laughs> because what was happening was the, the congressman, and granted, he was man enough to call me himself, but by calling Alvin's lawyer, he's putting Alvin on notice. So the next time Alvin would go there, Alvin would be arrested for trespass because his yeah. lawyer got notified that he was yep. not to be there. So I had already learned by this time that Alvin, and I later learned, and Virginia, for every ounce of suspicion and distrust that they had for local government, they had correlating pounds of hope, tons of hope for what the federal government could do for them. Mm -hmm. Hence the letters to the president, hence Alvin's escape uh, one day from the courtroom and ending up in federal court and getting detained by U.S. Marshals, only to tell his effort to tell the federal judge that I was not doing him any good. <laughs> and uh, he says that was Salesman Sam's advice, by the way. Yeah. And uh, all that was going on and it was it was just so so difficult a case um so uh, it, it just was such a hard client which made the ultimate victory that much sweeter mm -hmm. because we did win there was not guilty on all counts and when we left that courthouse i just off the cuff because i hadn't prepared any remarks I told the assembled press and public and uh, onlookers, I said, you know, I give you Alvin Ridley, a free man and an innocent man. And then I added, and a man ready to restore his reputation in this community. I knew how everybody had just rushed to judgment on him. Yeah. I also knew that he deserved a lot of the suspicion because of how he was interpreted, how we were interpreting him. And, um, but I could tell Alvin was struggling. He was really trying and mm -hmm. he and I had made a connection. We had been to battle together. We had been to war together. Mm -hmm. And so for many, many years, we have maintained our friendship and I've taken him to lunch, uh, before his recent illness, uh, twice a week. Uh, I'm going to go see him, him here in a little while. He's he's recovering from some uh, kidney disease issues. Mm -hmm. um, and um, he, he's just a delightful person. He he He's different now in the sense that the community has warmed to him. Nothing like a book. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> Nothing no. like a book to turn some hearts. It's and, uh, and, 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 and it and and for that reason, that is the best reason that this book exists, because it has turned this whole community, whole county's heart toward this man, who is a lot softer now. He's a lot. Uh, his voice is is a lot lighter, higher pitched, and softer. Yeah. And um, but with the knowledge now that we all have acquired about autism and neurodivergent uh, uh, people, everybody is more understanding. Mm -hmm. Now Alvin will still give them the same cold stare if somebody comes up to us at lunch and speaks to us, but now they wink at me because they say, oh, I got the Alvin cold stare, you know, <laughs> what used to be called the death stare. Yeah. Uh, you know, I got the Alvin death stare and they wink at me like I'm in on the, I'm in on it. I understand. And it's really fantastic because uh, he'll make a comment after they leave, you know, like, uh, 
I know where that guy could get a job. Well, where, Alvin? Radio. That's all he does is talk, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, he's he's spot on. Yeah. But uh, well, and good I apologize to have about the beeping going on. There's some road work going on here. Uh, okay. But, you know, it's it's good to have a happy ending. But I think I know the answer to this. But when people close the book after they finish reading Zenith Man, what do you hope they take away from it? Well, I think maybe every eccentric inspiration of classic Southern Gothic eccentric characters probably is a soul that is neurodivergent. And maybe we need to understand that and try to get services to them, but at least try to understand them better when we are trying to get them to understand us. Another thing that just kind of poured out in the book, Roger, and this was only when I started writing my manuscript. I was trying to remember a time that I took Alvin to my parents' house. I had totally repressed. Uh, my, one of my sisters said, well, I've got our mother's journals. Well, none of us wanted to read our mother's journals because she was, you know, she was mad at us half the time. But uh, I decided I would look at that section of journal those several months in uh, late 1997 when I did take Alvin to, to my parents' house just because he liked them and they liked him. And they lived in another town. They didn't have the same little local prejudices and biases that the town of Ringgold did. But he was our TV guy. We had nothing but great feelings about him. Uh, and my sister had gone to school with him. So she kind of understood him a little better. So, uh, but I'm looking in my mother's journals for this. And then suddenly, and I'd obviously repressed this, an entire intervention that we did for my father and his alcoholism. I'd completely repressed that. And I remembered I talked to my, my father was the first person that I told that I was advising Alvin Ridley. And this was months before he was actually charged. And my dad, when sober, gave me some insight on that. But it also made me remember that struggle that my father was doing and getting medication to try to curb his addiction to alcohol. And and I distinctly remembered him showing up at the trial. And you got to know, Roger, my dad never showed up at anything mm. that he wasn't drunk. Well, I mean, I was 39 and I couldn't remember a sporting event or anything that I'd ever done as a kid. And, and usually that meant he didn't show up at all. He was a very hard worker, never missed a day of work. Yeah. But just after work, he, he would hit the bottle. And uh, Alvin was excited to see him at the trial, and I was horrified. Uh, and then I went back and realized he's sober. He's sober, yeah. and he's locked in, and he came to the rest of the trial in the old courtroom after the roach, uh, roach infestation of the first courtroom. And when I was looking for photos for this book, uh, I learned that the newspaper, which was a combined newspaper, um, that their whole photo archives of the last 20 something years was at the Chattanooga Hamilton County Public Library. So I went there and found 247 negatives. Oh. I got a light box and a loop and I found three pictures of my dad and Alvin oh. and my dad whispering something to him that and this was in the, the glory of after the verdict. And Alvin doesn't remember what my dad said to him, but I remember what my dad said to me. And that was that he was proud of me. Uh, and uh, that was, uh, I was terribly proud of him, yeah. but that was kind of what I was going through. And, and I realized that Alvin, Alvin's neurodivergence made it very difficult for him to follow we all talk in slang and metaphor and, and, you know, words and phrases that you, you know, you really, 
it takes a neurotypical brain to follow a neurotypical conversation. Yep. And even then, you know, I'm I'm trying to understand what young people are saying these days, and I don't know. That's just a natural progression, I guess. But I'm realizing now that as a child of an a, of a alcoholic parent, I was constantly trying to keep an even keel on things. Mm. Alvin was a huge challenge to me. And yet I was probably not reacting the way Alvin needed me to react because mm. I was just frustrated. Yeah. So we were clearly not understanding each other. And, and probably I was the worst combination of a lawyer and client for him, but we figured out a way to make it work. And part of that was the spite of not wanting the Congressman to, to have any kind of uh power over my client or the ability to boss me around about my client. Oh, I will tell you this. I didn't know how to tell Alvin. The Congressman is against you now, but uh -huh. you, you can, you can, you know, check off that branch of federal government now will not help you. Yeah. Um, so I just had to think, how do I tell him this? Because Alvin would be one that if I just, you know, fussed at him and said, the congressman called and you're scaring the ladies there, Alvin would take that as a challenge. Yeah. He would think, okay, I need to double down and go back there. So I took him outside, mainly because I didn't want anybody in the office to hear me, and went to his car and I said, Alvin, let me tell you, that damn congressman. He hates me so much, Alvin. He just told me that if you or me ever show up at his office, he's going to have us both arrested. And I said, Alvin, I cannot, I can't be arrested right now. Um, you know, just got married and just getting my law practice back on track. I can't afford to get arrested. And he looked kind of bewildered. And I said, you know, the election. And he looked even more bewildered because he knew I'd get my ass whipped. And so finally I said, Alvin, if you'll just help me with your case by talking about your case when we need to talk about it and help me help you when this is all over with, I'll take you and show you where he lives. <laughs> <laughs> And that satisfied Alvin because now I wasn't somebody preaching to him or ordering him around. I was letting him in on a little plan. And of course I never did. And in my acknowledgements, I say that uh, I, I didn't because our Congressman later served two terms as our governor. <laughs> and in that position, he did, he defied all expectations and did a number of wonderful reforms for convicted felons, trying to end, you know, lifelong probation for people early on, giving them the keys to success, uh, creating ways to shorten uh, long sentences and early terminate them under certain conditions. And I wrote in my acknowledgments, for that reason, I never told Alvin where he lived. <laughs> And I think that's a great way to end up. I just want to make sure that I've not left anything on the table. Is there any aspect you want to make sure gets in this? Well, first place, there's more than one Zenith man. There's the, the cover. Yeah. And I and the door mysteriously opened in the middle of this podcast. That'll be something you can explain later. Okay. Uh, but uh, the book is a photo from an amusement park that we have here in my county in Catoosa County, Georgia. And that's Alvin and Virginia Ridley, uh, 1965, wow. just before they married, maybe, maybe 66. Yeah. But knowing the amusement parks, uh, seasonal ways, um, there's more than one book titled Zenith man on Amazon. The other one is our story fictionalized by a person who told, didn't tell either one of us about it, uh, uh, changed our names, wrote a short story. I would have loved to have known about it, but 
that author took the title from what I had given New Line Cinema on a screenplay of an authorized screenplay that they bought in 2004, but never did anything with. Yeah. So uh, I just want people to buy the right book. And I've had <laughs> I've had two artificial intelligence books pop up, one from Nigeria and the other one from somewhere in Europe that were tr you know much cheaper than my book and trying to draw off the audience that I was out beating the drums for to generate to buy my book it it, it infuriates me the way yeah. this industry has now just like everything else been almost ruined by the internet yeah but of course the good edge of the sword is I'm selling books there off of go. it so and we'll help you do some of that. Uh, I want to thank you so much. Our guest today, McCracken Poston Jr. The book is, and make sure you get this one, Zenith Man, subtitled Death, Love, and Redemption in a Georgia Courtroom. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Roger. What a wonderful podcast. And I wish you great luck with it. Okay.